I am your certified techno-archaeologist. And what we are doing, and this is a perfect play on his talk, because NASA, they tell the government, oh, we're just going to design this for three years, and it lasts 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. And so our project that we have done, one of the two that I'm talking about, is the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project. NASA sent five spacecraft to the moon in 1966 and 1967 to do a photo reconnaissance of the moon in preparation for the Apollo program. No one in history had ever seen the moon up close. Think about this. At one meter resolution, no one in all of human history until the mid-1960s had seen the moon up close. And they did it with this camera right here. This is in the days before CCD, so it was a 70 millimeter film camera. And how it worked, it had almost a mile of film on board, and it took images that were processed on board the spacecraft and then were scanned. The images were scanned with a five micron light Light beam and transmitted back to the Earth through what's called the DSIF, which is now the Deep Space Network for NASA, at Goldstone, Madrid, and Wimmera in Australia. And this is what they did with them. They printed out these big pictures and they walked around there going, oh, you know, that looks like a good place to land. Oh, is there too many rocks there? Look at all those craters. And so they did this uh, with tapes. They recorded the data on tapes. And what they did after they went around and did their walkthrough, they went to these tapes and they took and digitized these tapes and put them on the world's largest supercomputer at the time, which is a Univac 1170, had 256K of RAM. And so they processed these images off of these analog tapes, and this is what we saw. This is what the American people saw in 1966. And these tapes, though, you got to understand, on the spacecraft, it was very high quality 70 millimeter film. But this is what the American people saw. That's not 70 millimeter film quality. And so when I was a student researching in the 1980s, I've kind of figured this out. And I, I went and looked and I found out these tapes existed and I just couldn't get them because there wasn't any machines anymore that could run the tapes. This is a, a guy in 1987. They were trying to uh, bring the tape drives back to life because the federal government, it's the opposite of planned obsolescence. It's let's keep it forever. And the tapes were in the federal archives and uh, they got them out and they brought them to JPL. And Nancy Evans, who worked on the Viking program, she saved the tapes. And this is what people do all over to save our history. She saved the tapes, she found the drives, and they tried to bring them back. Well, they couldn't because in the late 1980s, technology really wasn't there to do the kind of stuff that we can do today. So, in 2007, this is what I found in Nancy's garage in Los Angeles. These tape drives had been in her garage in a horse property outside of Los Angeles for about 15 years, but I'd worked at a television studio uh, repairing these uh, tape drives. I ran a studio in LA. I'm going, oh, what the heck, I think we can do it. But this is what it looked like when we found it. And then we found the tapes. The tapes were at NASA JPL, and they were saved because somebody found out that we had lost the original images for the Apollo moon landings. And so I said, oh my God, you can't get rid of any tapes. And so we found these tapes right before they were going to be destroyed. And so Dr. P. Warden, who is the center director at NASA Ames, uh, I've known him since I was a student, and he said, Dennis, come on up. So we got the tapes from Nancy, the tape machines from Nancy's, the tapes from NASA JPL, and we brought them up to Mac Moons. At NASA Ames Research Park is part of the Moffett Navy Base, and the Moffett Navy Base it was shut down, and this McDonald's had just shut down, and so we were able to move in there. And so we got to work. We refurbished the drives, had a bunch of students helping us refurbish the drives. We did that. We did our techno-archaeology going back and finding what the old formats were, what was on the tape, and then we worked and we worked, and then we had our success. Okay, folks, what we're seeing here. And so that here. right there, I'm going to abbreviate yeah. it because I don't have much time. This is what our Earthrise looked like after digital processing in, 19, in 2008. This is a comparison to what the American people saw and what we did.
This is what the earth looked like from a quarter of a million miles away after digital reprocessing. And we actually were able to get good data and this helped us get some work with the National Snow and Ice Data Center to find out the edge of the Antarctic ice pack in that year. We had three questions in our project. Can you bring the tapes back? We did it. Can you refurbish the drives? We did it. Is the data any better than what we already had from a parallel film record? We answered all of those in the affirmative. We put it together like this. We assembled a final image. Now this was our next image. This is a Copernicus crater. This, this was called the image of the century by Life magazine. The top is the film-based record. Below is our digital reprocessing. We found out that we had four times the dynamic range from the magnetic tape data. And so this is a surveyor spacecraft on the moon. Uh, this is the before shot with the Apollo lunar landing uh, from Apollo 12 on top. Uh, this is 14 on top of it. We were able to zoom, 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 and zoom, and we found the rock that the Apollo 14 astronauts were standing by when they said they couldn't find the crater. Well, the crater was on the other side of the rock. They just didn't know it. So this is another one of our images, and so we've just had an amazing, uh, a fun time with this. We captured 1,500 tapes, and we were able, we're still in the process of digitizing. Uh, we're working with Adobe right now. They're trying to help us out to do the final image processing. And we have gigapixel images available at... Uh, just look for SERVI, the Solar System Exploration Virtual Research Institute Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project at NASA Ames. Now our next adventure in technoarchaeology, even faster, is the ISEE 3 Reboot Project, which was a global project, mostly volunteer, to recover this spacecraft launched in 1978. It had a three-year lifetime. It was still alive in 2014. NASA had thrown away all the hardware, though, to talk to it. So this is a spacecraft, and this is what it looked like. Its original mission was to, is a first spacecraft and invented the uh, discipline of heliophysics. And it set out one million miles in front of the Earth towards the sun. And it did that for three years until some very bright scientists said, hey, we can do all of these little maneuvers here, and it'll be the first spacecraft ever to go to a comet. So ISEE-3 in 1985 was the first spacecraft to pass within 8,000 kilometers directly through the tail of Comet Gacobini Zinner. Well, in 2014, these guys, they, they set the spacecraft in 1987 to come back to the Earth in 2014. The only thing they didn't plan for was NASA not having money. <laughs> So we had a problem that it only had so much fuel and it was going up exponentially. And so we only had a few weeks to work. We had no hardware, we had no money, and we, we had a bunch of enthusiastic folks. And so we took off, we started on uh, the, uh, April 12th of 2014. We raised $160,000 in 43 days. In six weeks, using software-defined radio and a bunch of really good hackers, we put together, went to Arecibo with a ham radio transmitter. Oh yeah, we used the biggest dish in the world. We kind of cheated there. So we were at Arecibo, we put it all together, and we were able to command the spacecraft six weeks from the beginning of the project when it was 15 million kilometers away from the Earth. We're the first private group ever to do that. And this is how we did it. There's a great local Silicon Valley company called Edis Research, uh, a, a part of National Instruments, and we use their USRPs. We use the Arecibo dish to transmit, and then we received in Germany, and over the internet, we were able to do what we called half-ass real-time uh, data communications uh, around the world. And so we were able to command the spacecraft. We were able to do ranging to the spacecraft. We were able to get the telemetry from the spacecraft, and this is how 
bad to the bone the engineers were in the 1970s. These temperatures are less than one degree off from the original thermal analysis done by these guys in 1975. That deserves applause. We did our operations at our Mac Moons. We had students, we had high school students. The student that you saw in the earlier Mac Moons picture, the young lady there, Casey uh, Harper. Casey started with us in middle school. She's now in college. Jacob started with us in high school. He's now graduating college. And Marco, who's not in this, he just finished his master's thesis on a project related to the spacecraft. So we were able to talk to the spacecraft, get real-time data, but we found out just as, even if your car has a full tank of gas, if the fuel pump's not working, you're not going anywhere. Well, we had fuel left in the spacecraft, but the pressurant, which is nitrogen gas, it was a, a pressurized system, there was no pressurant left. We think what happened that when it went through the tail of the comet, the dust from the comet penetrated the shell of the spacecraft and just made it through the skin of the tanks enough to cause the nitrogen to molecularly go away. And, and this was Marco's uh, master's thesis, and the NASA folks uh, have bought into this now, but it was, we had an amazing time being able to do this, and this is actually, we told it to do a maneuver, and it started perfectly new. So that's what, that's analogous to having the fuel in your carburetor and then nothing behind it. We had a lot of fun. We did a collaboration with Google Creative Labs, and we have a, 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 a website, spacecraftforall.com. This is some of the science. We recommissioned 36-year-old scientific instruments, and this is from one of the instruments where we actually were able to do exactly the same kind of science that they did 36 years ago with the spacecraft. And so that's the absolute opposite of what our previous speaker was just talking about in how NASA does their job. Think about Voyager. It's four, it's four billion miles out there and it's still talking to us. But I wanna close, and I got through this pretty quickly. I call this my bonsai version of my talk. I usually do this in an hour. Where we go next? You see a lot of folks right now talking gloom and doom. Humans are gonna be extinct in 100 years. I don't believe that. We have a choice in our civilization between Mad Max and the Starship Enterprise. We techno-archeologists, we wanna go into the future and we want the Star Trek Starship Enterprise. Thank you.